Okay. Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Our group call here today, we're going to be focusing on sustainability and what that means in terms of following the program and our health, because I think that it's, um, you know, it, it's taken on a very specific connotation that's, you know, oh, well, we have to we have to go with whatever's going to fight climate change and, you know, reduce our carbon footprints. And even if that's the detriment of our health. And um, so today I want to touch on some things about this program that, you know, in terms of why I got into health and wellness in the first place, a huge part of that was environmentalism. And, you know, that brought me around uh, through my journey to, you know, to uh, believing that veganism was the only way to save the planet to realizing that, oh, that just increased my uh, dependency on monocropping and, and, you know, uh, intensive agriculture. And now we're seeing that conflict kind of playing out <clears throat> on a larger field where we're seeing, you know, major players like Bill Gates, who have invested billions of dollars in uh, Beyond Meat, because he believes that humans should just eat proteins extracted from legumes. And even if that requires like, you know, genetic modification and, is, and a laboratory to produce that protein. So where do we go from here? Well, as we, you know, begin to emphasize our own health in this process, we want to know that what we're doing is not just good for us. It's, it is good for the planet. And the reality is, is that the more research and the more you dig into what we're doing and why you'll see is that what's good for us is good for the planet and it is sustainable. And when we say sustainable, that means like if civilization ended tomorrow, you could pretty much still follow this diet, this program. You might have to do a little bit of work to find, you know, the local farmers and, uh, and you know, the food supply to support that. And yeah, you might not be drinking as much orange juice or coconut water, but those things are not vital. They're not indispensable to supporting, maintaining our health. What is indispensable is knowing that we are getting adequate caloric intake and a, right, a correct ratio of protein, carbs, and good saturated fats. And the reality is, is that, you know, even a family of five can survive off of one cow for an entire year. How do I know that? Because, <clears throat> you know, we've gotten a quarter of a steer, one fourth of a steer. And for our family, that lasted about four or five months. You can't do that with, you know, um, beyond meat, right? Uh, heavily processed foods that require a lot of energy and machinery and chemical processing in order to create adequate amounts of nutrition. Whereas a cow literally just hanging out on a field all day long for its brief but not stressful life can provide far more nutrition than what would be required with acres and acres of, you know, if we're just going to use soybean as the example, plus giant machinery, chemicals, tons of water input. Okay. Uh, so since we, you know, left New York, we moved to the country and, you know, when we drive my son to school, we pass several farms and you can see some that grow, uh, you know, like very intensive uh, agriculture, you know, like tomatoes, things like that. And you can see all of the chemical inputs. You see these giant vats, you see the machinery, you see kind of the devastation to the soil. And then you pass a pasture where there's just some cows hanging out and the farmer never has to do anything. These cows just hang out, they eat, they, you know, the farmer drops off some hay, they graze, the field looks pristine uh, beside some cow poop. And, you know, there's like a nice stream. They go and they drink water. So there's no irrigation that's required. 
there's no um, there's no need for significant uh, intervention. And so this is a uh, key to understanding like, well, what, what's, what are we doing? Okay. We're, we're trying to heal from the ills of a industrial agricultural system. One that has been designed to emphasize um, extracting maximum profitability from both the earth and the products that they produce. And then third from the consumers, right? So we've created a system that is incredibly dependent forming where people have little to no knowledge of what their food is, where it's coming from, how it's produced, or even what it does to their bodies. So interestingly, um, earlier this week, Harvard um, Chan School of Health, I think it's called, posted on Instagram that their newest guidelines to uh, support human health and sustainability. And they had to cut, they had to turn off the comment section because people were just aghast at how awful these recommendations were. First of all, they recommended consuming the same amount in calories of refined sugar as animal protein. I mean, that right there, I mean, that's just uh, so ridiculous. Um, but then it, it, it suggested consuming almost four times as much of your protein from plant source proteins. So let's just think about that right now, right? If, so plants, plant foods, yes, they have protein, but they have very small amounts of protein. And so they have to be processed, extracted, and concentrated in order to, in any way, equate to what we would just get from eating animal products. So we have to then assume that Harvard ha believes that we need to overproduce the higher protein legumes like soy or peas in order to create an adequate quantity to be able to extract enough protein to support human life. And then that would be better than just having some cows out on pasture. And so uh, a lot of times these arguments fall on some logical fallacies like the, you know, oh, there's only, there's only, um, uh, you know, a confined animal feed lot, the CAFO uh, meat. That's like, that's your only choice, right? And if you compare, you know, any sort of agriculture to that, yeah, things are, you know, CAFO agriculture looks really bad. Uh, and it's, it's bad for the animals, it's bad for the planet, and it's bad for humans. But that's not what we get to compare. So a huge part of this process is becoming more aware and making better decisions of where we source our foods. And that goes for meat, dairy, and you know, vegetables, fruits, everything. And when we start to make those decisions, we start to not only minimize the harm that we cause as a consumer, but we can actually create a net benefit. And so a lot of the research that's being ignored by Harvard Chan School of Health is showing that animal husbandry properly managed is a part of regenerative agriculture. And really this diet and, you know, what I teach is regenerative health. So we are going to, you know, scorched earth devastation. We were going to the Dust Bowl, which is, you know, um, metaphoric for what many of us have experienced in our own health. And we are learning how to make that soil fertile again. And that doesn't happen by dumping chemicals on it, right? Which is kind of a metaphor for medications or for even for supplements, really. Um, Somebody I, I look up to, I admire uh, for health and wellness and, and has taught me a lot, said that the supplement industry is really uh, like Big Pharma Junior. And to a certain extent, it really is. Uh, you know, they're, 
sometimes, you know, in, in the supplement industry, there's, there's a very blurry division between what's a supplement and what's a medication. And, um, you know, I saw a lot of people recently kind of griping about how the FDA is um, usurping, you know, our, our ability to use certain supplements that have been on the market for many, many years because they're now claiming them to be drugs. And the reality is, is that, yeah, they, they really do function like drugs. They're extremely potent, concentrated, isolated chemicals. Doesn't mean that they're bad. It just means that they're not natural. It means that they are, you know, beholden to an industrial laboratory process. So coming back to how I started this conversation, right? What happens if the, you know, civilization ends tomorrow, you're not going to be able to get your supplements. And with this program and the diet, the way that we're following it, you know, everybody's process is different and some take longer than others, but eventually the goal is to create something that is sustainable. And that by definition means that it cannot depend on supplements to maintain. The goal is to create a level of health and self-mastery in terms of knowing what to eat and how to maintain your body that supplements are no longer necessary. They might still help make things work better, but if supplements cease to be available, you would still be great. And the fact of the matter is, is I've had people who, you know, for whatever reasons, either they were too sensitive to the supplements that I do recommend on the program, or they couldn't access them because they live in another country or whatever reason, didn't have the supplements. They just did the diet. They still saw incredible benefits and results in the healing that they wanted. In fact, funny story, uh, going to swim lessons with my son and um, one of the other moms uh, who's uh, on the program says to me, oh, my mom is here visiting. And, you know, she's uh, very overweight and has a lot of health problems. And she's just been eating what we've been feeding her for the past four, three, four days since she got to town. And in just that short amount of time, she's lost eight pounds. It's because all you need to do is make these changes in the diet and eliminate the industrialized processed junk. So what are we specifically talking about? Well, nut and seed oils, very specifically, those they're very um, chemical intensive to produce, uh, to refine, extract, and package. And they're just not something that is natural, right? If you, if you uh, had to live on your own farm, subsistence farming, you would not grow, um, you know, uh, rapeseed, right? Which is uh, what canola oil is made out of uh, and put in all that energy and effort into making rapeseed oil, which when you do extract it, if I, and I recommend everybody look up a video of this, it's absolutely horrifying. It's like this gray sludge um, that, has, that has to then treat it again um, to deodorize it because it has this awful odor. Uh, let's see if this works. This is so horrifying. You might not be able to see it. That face that is usually covered by her phone has finally made an appearance. Canola oil is a commonly used type of cooking oil. It's derived from the seed of the canola plant, which grew to a conveyor so below. The, seed. the foreign material remains on top. A conveyor moves it to a... 42% of canola seed is oil. This screw press... Ex 70 minutes exits the other end this, of the press and this moves is what on to a second extraction. This one, and then put in large tanks. Yeah, your your small your small family farm here. It looks like an oil refinery. It's not sustainable, right? Um, if you ever looked up the uh, Oatly factory. You know, everybody loves this oat milk. That's a huge craze these days, right? It's the same thing. It's this, you know, giant um, 
industry. It looks like a gasoline refinery. Oh. See, they, they try to hide these pictures. I've, I've, I only see them on like, um, you know, Instagram accounts of people doing like exposés where they've like, you know, gone and taken pictures, right? So these, these are not sustainable. These are not things that you're going to be able to, um, you know, reproduce if you have to start producing your own food. Now, you know, most of us don't have any intentions of ever becoming a farmer, but we want to take into consideration, like who is producing our food and what kind of life do they get to, uh, to get to enjoy? Oh, Laura says, check out biggest little farm. I did, I think I did see that. It's like the, the family that goes and buys a farm and, and it's like, it's like one disaster after another. And then they get this guy that helps them. And, and then the barn owls return and it's a very, yeah, beautiful story. Um, it teaches you about how one, one thing in life impacts another, right? And it's yeah. the whole circle life, which is, it's, it's a good documentary in the end, yeah. even though it's traumatic. Yeah. I watched it on the plane. Um, we were, you know, we were going to visit the grandparents or something like that. And I remember Rachel wasn't watching it with me and she looks over, she's like, are you, are you crying about this farm movie? Like, yeah, it's so great. <laughs> but yeah, it's really, it, it's that, yeah, everything is connected and you can't change one part of a system without that affecting every other part of the system. Okay, and so if we apply that same thinking to how do we create a sustainable diet and sustainable lifestyle? Well, we can't just continue going on being like, oh, well, you know, I'm using supplements to treat symptoms, to change one thing in a system because you're going to get a cascading chain of effects from that. So the whole purpose of this process is like, okay, day one, strip it down to the, the bare essentials, what is absolutely necessary. And if you only followed that very basic diet where you're basically just eating meat, dairy, eggs, fruit, potatoes, pretty much all of that, you could, if you had a couple of acres, you could produce that diet for yourself with very little effort to, you know, you know, okay, you got to milk the cow, you got to, you know, get the chicken uh, or, you know, get the eggs from the chicken. Um, and then yes, it's, it takes a lot of work to, um, to slaughter a cow. Uh, but again, totally doable. People have been doing that for thousands of years without modern machinery. And the reason that they've been doing it that way is because, you know, Hey, this, this is what has been working. And as soon as we start adding in things like, you know, Oh, fish oil. Oh, that's all natural. It's coming from a fish. Well, yeah, but the process of, you know, extracting the oil from the fish, with all of this machinery, printing it into capsules, into bottles, all of this stuff, right? That you're taking something that was natural and you're making it into something that is very unnatural. And so we see this happening on both sides of the aisle, right? We have people that, you know, couldn't care less about their diet, the food that they eat, um, how many medications their doctors put them on. And we have people who are, you know, almost elitist, right, about how perfect their diets are, but they're on the other extreme and they're doing some, a lot of the same things that the people on the other extreme are doing. And, you know, it just goes to show is like that you, life is not in the extremes. There has to be some sort of middle ground uh, that allows for um, you know, fluctuations and adaptability um, that you can't achieve living in an extreme. And so I see this when I have people who come to me who say, hey, I, you know, I thought I was doing everything perfect. I was, you know, doing, you know, measuring all of my macros and, uh, and doing my keto and carb cycling and not eating uh, except out of a four hour window every day. And then, you know, everything comes crashing down. That's just one, another version of an extremely unhealthy, unbalanced diet and, and way of living. One that would not be appropriate for all uh, phases of life, right? 
So for myself, having a family, um, having a wife who was pregnant and having a kid, um, you know, I didn't want to, to continue believing that I had to eat some way completely differently than, than my, my son and my pregnant or nursing wife. And so I, I figured out, okay, well, what, what, what did it take for him to be happy? What would he actually enjoy eating where, um, you know, he wouldn't have to be some sort of pariah, right? Around all of his family going to, or all his friends going to school. And what would it take to actually make that diet healthy? And the reality is, is that it's what we've been eating for hundreds, if not thousands of years before profitability became the sole motivator in food and food production. Whoops. We got our hands full over here. <laughs> and so, you know, if we dream one day of having a farm and being able to produce much of what we need to live and survive, well, the reality is, is that we're not going to be drinking green juices because there's really not any good reason to produce tons and tons of greens. They don't actually provide real nourishment for survival. If you just ate greens all day, every day, they went tubing, buddy. You would not survive. You would become, you know, uh, an emaciated human. And that's exactly what happened to me. Um, and, you know, the further people go down that rabbit hole, the, the more clear it is that it's not going to sustain their health and their happiness. So what will? Well, you know, a lot of the things that we call comfort foods are perfectly healthy until we start contaminating what was, you know, naturally occurring in those foods before uh, modern, the modern industrial food system, right? So if we make biscuits and gravy with real butter, not canola oil, with, um, you know, organic wheat flour, not GMO corn starch, right? All of these ingredients that have snuck into our diets and have really permeated everything. Then these are perfectly healthy foods. And these are the foods that we thrive on. Our family thrives on them. Somebody asked me once, you know, oh, you got this meat smoker. I thought, you know, smoked meat is bad. And I said, well, how many traditional cultures do you know that use that eat smoked meat. Can you name one that doesn't? They all do. That is the most ancient way of cooking and preparing meats and fish uh, that permeate, you know, it's everywhere on the planet, everywhere you go. And in fact, there's this really great um, uh, one of those food, like the chef's table that, um, you know, they pick like one chef and, and feature them. You can see it on Netflix. There's one, this guy uh, down in um, like Chile or Argentina. And uh, he, you know, he's still to this day uh, is cooking in an open pit. And um, he's become so famous. People travel all over the, you know, from everywhere on the planet to come just to have uh, dinner with this guy that he prepares in a traditional manner. And so what made smoked meat look bad, um, you know, this goes back again to like, what, what kind of science is Harvard doing? They're doing these kind of observational studies. Um, and then they say, oh, it looks like people who eat smoked meats have higher, you know, amounts of, uh, you know, heart disease and things like that. But the reality was, is that, you know, they're, they're trying to isolate for one variable, which is not <laughs> the only variable. So these are people who probably were also consuming lots of canola oil, vegetable oil, seed oils, um, modern fruits and vegetables, which are also loaded with carotenoids. 
that's something else that, you know, I like to point out to people is like, you know, broccoli didn't exist until about 1920. Before that, the only brassicas that people ate were essentially cabbage and, um, you know, maybe turnips. <laughs> that was pretty much it. And then the modern agricultural system came in and said, oh, how can we, you know, extract more profitability from this easy to grow vegetable? Let's create more varieties. And what they did is that, you know, as they started selecting for specific characteristics, they also inadvertently selected for these plants ability to withstand things like pests, including us. So they began producing vegetables with higher amounts of natural pesticides, carotenoids, and other chemicals like in brassicas that are also like a anti thyroid. And then these foods, because they were easy to grow, easy to ship around the country, around the world, began to permeate our diets so thoroughly that people are aghast to suggest that maybe take a break, give, give the broccoli a break for a little while. Now, what? How can you even suggest that? We have to eat broccoli. Well, what did people do before there was broccoli? There were other things to eat. And so we've lost uh, that, that, that tradition, that heritage of food that has become driven purely by profit motive. And so when we talk about sustainability, we have to think, well, if things are being produced today because they're subsidized, right? They require subsidized agriculture to make them profitable. Then these are things that you're not going to do on your own, unless the government is paying you to grow these things that are otherwise not profitable, not sustainable, right? So growing huge, massive fields of soybean, not sustainable. And people say, well, you know, oh, in China, they eat tons of soy. And you go, actually, no, they don't. They don't actually eat tons of soy. It's, it's a condiment. It's something that's sprinkled here and there. There's literally like one soy dish called Mapo Tofu. Uh, and pretty much it's just, a, it's just a carrier for uh, hot pepper oil, right? Because tofu is like a sponge. So it's just like, and even that, they don't eat it by itself. It's like you mix that into other dishes to kind of like give them more heat. And, uh, and otherwise, how do they use it? They ferment the soybean, right? Make fermented soybean paste. Um, and they make a little bit of, uh, uh, soy milk, right? And then drink that. And it's kind of a medicinal thing. It's not like everybody just drinks soy milk there. They, it's used for specific, you know, um, indications. Um, and then what's left over from making the soy milk, they make into that uh, uh, tofu skin, uh, which is kind of an interesting thing that's also kind of used as a condiment uh, for this interesting texture that they add to dishes. So, you know, again and again, we see is that what's what's really natural and sustainable without modern uh, chemical petroleum intensive agriculture is not what we see represented on our plates or in the grocery store today. So it's up to us to say, well, you know what, um, to be well adapted to a sick society is no great measure of health. And that's, you know, Christian Murdy said that almost a hundred years ago. And what he was looking at was saying, Hey, look, as people continue to just kind of like go with the flow of what, um, you know, corporations are kind of dictating as our choices uh, and our lifestyles, we are getting collectively sicker and sicker. So really the only, the only alternative is to thoroughly investigate what, it means to be healthy and happy and what is required to support that because then you're going to have to start looking outside of the mainstream to say, oh, well, everybody says I can keep doing what I'm doing as long as I, uh, you know, take these supplements. Well, then what you're doing, what everyone else is doing is not going to work. So this whole process, what's sustainable? is here's, you know, you start the program, you get out of crisis, you learn what the 
major problems are in the human diet, in the modern human diet, and, and start to learn how to adapt to avoiding them. And then over the course of time, it's about figuring out what really works for you. How much meat? How often do you eat eggs? How much dairy? Um, what kind of fruits? And how much uh, gelatin gummies? How much broth? How often do you need to eat? And how much sugar? And uh, do you do well with iced coffee? Because maybe you don't. And everybody's going to be a little bit different. And so that's why this program is, is not designed to be like, oh, you need to consume, you know, 2.5 ounces of this and four ounces of that and this at exactly this time and da, 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 da. It's more of a loose framework. And it says, hey, start with this and maybe this supplement. Why do we use these supplements? Because these are things that we want to be getting from your food anyway. So the diet already emphasizes vitamin E and vitamin K in the foods that we're choosing, in the, in, in the way that we're structuring the diet. So that if there weren't supplements, this would all still work. But if we wanna get results, better results faster, we can use some of these supplements to do that. What, you, you want some coffee? Okay. <laughs> so see, coffee works for some people. <laughs> for some people it doesn't. And, okay, that's enough. <laughs> and some people really love drinking ginger tea or dandelion tea. Some people hate it, right? Some people try the supplements at the beginning and it, they're just way too intense. They can't do it. So they don't. Now, what's a supplement that people have been using for thousands of years? Medicinal mushrooms, shilajit. Now you might not necessarily live close enough to the Himalayas to be able to you know, harvest your own shilajit, but that's something that has been used and naturally derived and processed for you know, much of human history. And same with medicinal mushrooms. Um, you know, I went to a medicinal mushroom um, museum essentially in China and they talked about, you know, that they, uh, there was a great um, Chinese philosopher and um, medicine man who discovered the benefits of, you know, reishi mushroom. And then he was basically revered as a god after that. And, um, you know, I can go anywhere. And like we were just, uh, oh, where Milo gets his swim lessons, there's a giant reishi mushroom on a log right outside the woman's house. So that, you know, this, this is the sort of stuff that's it's everywhere. You don't need machinery, industrial tools, and all this other stuff, a laboratory, in order to make these natural medicines. So long story short, right, just to sum up here, everything that we're doing, the goal here is to create less dependency, more independence, more autonomy for each of us. And if we, if we can succeed, succeed in doing that, we can positively influence and encourage others to do the same. And we can look around and, and eventually see a world one day that doesn't require centralized, top-down, authoritarian, profit-driven leadership. We create <laughs> personal responsibility and people who are self-driven and motivated to be producers, to, to, uh, to provide for themselves and for others. How does the coffee taste with that lollipop? <laughs> Alrighty. So that's my little rant. And if anybody wants to unmute themselves, asking questions or share any experiences or stories, we'd love to hear that.
How old? How old? How old is Milo? He just turned four. Four. Mm-hmm. I've never seen a four-year-old drink coffee. You like coffee, huh? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm using the Alfa mushroom coffee. So, oh, okay. It was, you know, very little. I mean, consider, you know, kids, considering how many kids his age drink like Coca Cola, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, and yeah, okay, fine. You want to drink this? It's, it's mostly milk. <laughs> okay. A little bit of coffee and some maple syrup. So, yeah. It's going to taste good. <laughs> and plus, he's right. going to get some additional mushrooms into his system. Would you go into the week? little bit on milk um you know yeah. i was able to find a farm that i was able to get you know milk from extremely Great. fresh heavy cream etc and unfortunately it didn't agree with me and i haven't had problems with regular milk that i've been getting grass-fed from the grocery store yeah um so i'm just Great. curious you know, what your thoughts are on that yeah and, so you know it's a I, it's a progression but I, you know i jumped right into the farm and didn't go well yeah. Well, so now also, you know, properly interpreting uh, what we're experiencing is, you know, is difficult. Um, but what I see is that when we switch from milk from the grocery store, even if it's good, grass fed, you know, all that stuff, um, you're getting much lower amounts of the lactoferrin. And the lactoferrin is very reactive. It is a, um, you know, it is one of the major components of our immune system that most people completely ignore. And they say, oh, dairy is so bad for you. And you go, well, then after millions of years of evolution, mammals just accidentally became dependent on milk. (laughs) Um, And, you know, for like a newborn baby before their immune system, you know, is actually developed. First, they get the colostrum, which is almost, you know, almost pure lactoferrin, like that's their entire immune system. And so this stuff, you know, gets into your system. And if you're, uh, if you're not used to, um, you know, large amounts of it, especially if it's, you know, unpasteurized or very gently pasteurized, which you're going to get, you know, from a small local farm versus the ultra pasteurized stuff in the store, um, it immediately starts to react with unbound iron. And it reacts with uh, microbes. It oxidizes the um, the lipid membranes of the of the um, of the microbes, and that's why if you go and you look at um, the lac, you know, just the Wikipedia page on lactoferrin, you'll see antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, anti-cancer. Yes, Milo. Oh, he wants to come back. He wants to show everybody his Star Wars. <laughs> um. And so, oops, back to. Well, I went all in because it was so yummy. So I definitely had a lot, you know, I filled up a whole glass and downed it. So, yep. you know, I can yeah. definitely back go off slow. and start eating into it. But. Yep, you definitely want to go slow. Um, especially if you're changing from, you know, stuff at the store to raw, um, you know, your body is going to react a little bit differently at first. Uh, so I advise people start with like a, 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 you know, a sip or two with other foods, um, or add it to the pasteurized milk just a little bit, you know, and, and slowly increase change the ratio. Um, the good thing about the raw dairy is that you can freeze it. So you can, you know, we, cause we, we only get a raw, milk delivery once a month. So we get enough for the whole month. And then, um, you basically pour off some on, on the top and then stick in the freezer. Um, so if you don't think you're going to go through it all, you could always, uh, you can freeze it like an ice cube tray or something like that. And then just have like small, uh, servings that you can, um, you know, just defrost as you need them and just go really slowly. Okay. And you'll see here, look, it's like lactoferrin prevents the attachment of H. pylori in the stomach. You know, so people who, a lot of people who think they're really healthy don't realize that they, you know, they still have stuff like, you know, H. pylori and, um, you know, different types of viruses and uh, uh, candida, right? You know, so many different types of candida. 
um, that when you start increasing the amount of lactoferrin you're, you're consuming, you're getting, um, you know, benefits that at first might be a little sketchy. I'm like, oh, this doesn't, this doesn't feel so great. Well, yeah, because you're, you know, we're changing your microbiome, your, your whole internal terrain is readapting to something that humans, you know, have uh, depended on dairy to support their immune systems uh, for thousands of years, you know, like pointing out the fact that, you know, the French have how many different types of cheese, you know, and, and pretty much every culture also, you know, uses dairy in, in some form, whether it's, you know, cows or goats or camels, right? Um, but, look, you know, we see here, like, look, anti-carcinogenic, right? And enterocolitis, right? Issues with Sjogren's, which is incredibly common. And, you know, what I find is a lot of people who kind of like start down the, um, the, the, the diet self-diagnosing rabbit hole. So they, you know, they eliminate sugar, they eliminate dairy, then they eliminate meats and, you know, and they're, and they're just taking away all of the things and making it that much harder for their bodies to sustain themselves that they're creating an unsustainable condition. And I went down that same process, you know, I wasn't in great health, um, you know, towards the end of college, but then I went vegan and that, you know, it was shortly after that, that chronic fatigue and the Eller Danlos syndrome, where I started having pain in all my joints because the connective tissue was weakening. My teeth were starting to, you know, weaken, um, my hair falling out. Uh, and that's when I was diagnosed with chronic Lyme, all that kind of stuff. And it turns out these, you know, these are all conditions of um, undernourishing our bodies. <laughs> and when we put that kind of pressure on our systems, you know, um, this is when our adaptive mechanisms uh, start to really kick in and, and they can only last for so long, right? So we, you know, we see the incredible prevalence of thyroid disorders, right? Especially with women um, who are more likely to uh, have, you know, restricted um, and di done dieting and done more cardio exercise and then, you know, burning out their thyroids, um, you know, just as one example. And, you know, men have another example, you know, from, you know, like the incredible prevalence of uh, prostate disease uh, in men, which is uh, very, very closely related to stress and, um, you know, and specific types of uh, infections, right? So, um, you know, once we, once we get ourselves off of, uh, you know, the, the extremes where we think we're doing something really great, but we're still doing, we're still doing the things that are causing our problems, right? Because, you know, if we, uh, we try to lose weight or we try to go on a healthy diet, try to do whole 30, um, we're still consuming massive amounts of carotenoids. We're still consuming massive amounts of um, polyunsaturated fats. Uh, we're still not properly addressing our iron and copper metabolism because we're eschewing things that would help with that for things that we think will mitigate some of our short-term issues. Right. So we're, we're trading short-term results. Oh, I want to lose a few pounds for long-term uh, creating, you know, digging ourselves deeper and deeper into these holes. Question about, um, Sorry, it's a little bit hard to understand you. Um, foods with copper in them, aside from yeah. orange juice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so anything that, has, anything that has vitamin C um, is going to be a great source. Um, oysters are also a great source. So, you know, and, and most, almost everybody tolerates them extremely well. You know, I mean, there are shellfish allergies, but besides that, I see no issues. Um, some people might 
be a little bit, you know, grossed out by them raw, but you can always just uh, roast them or steam them. Um, those are a really great uh, tool in this process. Um, and, uh, you know, eventually, you know, I, as people, you know, really progress much further down the road, um, you know, there may be a place for like, uh, you know, for organ meat. And so, um, you know, organ meat tends to be a great source of copper. Um, and there's several supplement companies. So, you, you know, you don't have to just like go buy a beef heart, you know, and eat that or, um, you know, but, you know, if you do it, it's not, it's great. The, you know, heart, heart meat is actually, uh, you know, really delicious and satisfying. It's a great source of taurine. You're going to get a lot of nutrients in there. Um, but again, you can get those as supplements if you really, you know, if you want to, um, so like, you know, what we do, uh, when I make my, uh, chicken broth and, you know, they have like the, the giblets in there. Um, I throw those in when I make the broth. And so you're going to extract some of that nutrition, uh, from that as well. And, um, you know, uh, you know, I see a lot of people saying, oh my gosh, you got to eat liver every day, you know, uh, takes liver supplements every day, every day. And, and then I continuously see people saying, well, Hey, I followed your advice. And, you know, I was taking your, you know, six liver capsules every day and I was eating liver every day. And then they, you know, they start to get very clear signs of the, of vitamin A toxicity. Um, so, you know, I definitely don't recommend going down that route. And, you know, does that mean that we can never eat liver? Well, I mean, I think a little liver, um, periodically, what would be, you know, let's go back to the example, right? Oh, Hey, we have, a, we're a family, we have a cow. We killed the cow. It has one liver, right? So how much liver are you going to eat that year? That, that would be a realistic amount of liver. And that's going to provide a lot of copper, um, a lot of uh, B vitamins, uh, certain other types of enzymes and things like that, that, you know, great. They're going to have benefits. Just um, don't overdo it. <laughs> Um, other copper foods, you know, strawberries are a great one. Um, and other, you know, certain other types of berries, I think, you know, camu berry. Um, I, I just, uh, picked some of that up cause we're trying to experiment Rachel's nursing and, you know, uh, one of the things they tell you that could contribute to like, um, you know, babies having, uh, reflux is citrus. So I said, well, we do drink a lot of orange juice. So, all right, let's, cut it out and see if it helps. And, uh, and so instead of that for vitamin C, we're using camu uh, berry. And I think that that is also um, a good source of copper besides in addition to the lot tons of vitamin C. Um, but yeah, that's a, uh, you know, a short list. Um, there's definitely others, uh, you know, that you can Google um, and they'll, you know, most of those will be totally fine um, on the diet. Just look out for things that are very high in uh, carotenoids. I used, I used to have a, um, that's a water bottle. It was a copper water bottle. And I think in India, they do a lot of that. Yeah. Well, and I, uh, that's, um, I think, uh, you know, uh, just a, a misunderstanding of how human physiology works when it comes to metals. Um, because yes, we can absorb copper from that. We can absorb iron from cast iron, but we lack a lot of the enzymes, right, to turn those into bioavailable. They're not organically bound. They don't have a carbon molecule bound to the metal. And then we can get problems. So like free iron and free copper, right? You see, you, maybe you're familiar with the women who have gotten the copper IUD uh, and react very poorly to that because it causes copper toxicity. Um, and so a lot of, this has happened to a lot of people too inadvertently because they have copper pipes in their house, right? Or they've been cooking with cast iron. Oh. And so we don't want that. We do not want that in our, in our food or in our water. Uh, we want to get that out and avoid it. Because when it's, when it's coming from, um, Metal. Whatever, whatever food, then you have the other 
things that come yes. with exactly that. plants plants have uh like fulvic and humic acid and and you know these are specially designed to help bind organically bind these metals from that they're uh, uh extracting from the soil and then we can either eat those plants that have those organically bound minerals or that we or we eat the animals that ate those plants because otherwise if we have a bunch of those metals running around we have uh, metalli metallothionine and we have uh, and we have lactoferrin um, that our body has to produce to uh, to bind those metals. It doesn't make them usable. It's just it, it neutralizes them so that we can get them out of our bodies. And you know, so you see a lot of people talking about like, oh, I, you know, mercury or lead and you know stuff like that, toxicity. And those are the same the same thing. That's why um, you know there's this incredible. Uh, you know, this urge in kind of like the health and wellness world to be like, well, if it, if it's from here, it's bad. But if it's, if it's the same thing from here, that's good. You know, so like I made a, I thought I was really clever and I made a meme um, where it's, it's this guy uh, where he's like, no, not that, this, yeah. And so he, he's like, no, not this. And I wrote PUFAs from canola oil, right? Like, no, I don't want that. But then he's like, then it says PUFAs from fish oil. Yeah, that's good. Right. And it's like, <laughs> well, it's the same thing. It's just from a different, from something different. It, 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 so how could one be good and one be bad? Uh, and the same thing, you know, when I, I try to explain about like vitamin A, it's like, well, okay, Sure, we clinic, you know, uh, we might clinically need, uh, you know, a small amount of this as it's like, because it does uh, stimulate the immune system and some and things, you know, with growth and whatever. Um, but that's an aldehyde. Aldehydes are toxic and carcinogenic, and it's extremely easy to overdo it, right? Um, and then the same thing with uh, iron and copper. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah you know, oh, iron from, you know, from the, from the meat and the dairy, you know, that, that's good. And then they try to say, it's the same as getting it from your cast iron, but those are not, they're not the same. So that's apples to oranges versus everything else that we're comparing here, is apples to apples. Those are both, they're both bad <laughs> versus no, this, this is okay because it's organically bound. It's bioavailable. Our bodies can use it. This is not. Another example, vitamin C. Everyone says, oh, I need vitamin C, but the vitamin C that they're going for is just citric acid or just ascorbic acid, and that's not vitamin C. That's one small piece of vitamin C, which is a giant kind of conglomeration of different molecules that function together. And as soon as we start to isolate just one of those, we get all kinds of problems. So people you know, I, I know I, for, for one, I took like um, uh, emergency for many years and then, you know, different vitamin C supplements, uh, Flintstones vitamins, whatever, that just had either, you know, ascorbic acid or citric acid or, um, or uh, sodium ascorbate. Um, and those were just one small piece. And what happens is that because of the way those are extracted, what normally happens is that they kind of, they get kind of attracted and bound to a copper molecule, right? So that's why we talk about vitamin C being the source of copper. So all of these molecules are kind of like um, uh, attracting and, and radiating around this, like this copper molecule. And if you extract just one of these, you know, from that bigger molecule or make it in a lab, independent of the copper, as soon as it gets in your body, guess what it's going to look for? Copper. Yeah. Yep. So what is what is the entire C complex that it's just like all these different so it's sodium and magnesium and yep. whatever ascorbates? Yep, yep. So different different uh ratios of ascorbates and you know citric acids uh and um and then bioflavonoids. Um Flavonoids, right? Yeah, that are another part of that. And that, so this is a, uh, you know, um, I'm I'm going to be adding uh, and recommending, uh, you know, um, not just honey, but like uh, bee pollen. 
Um, I, I just remember that. Before I did, ten, uh, for right Laura, now, beet pollen is another that. big source. What's that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I used to take, take um, <laughs> I, I like beet pollen. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, especially if you can get local bee pollen, um, great mm -hmm. source of, of the bioflavonoids and copper. Um, and uh, you know, really great for your system. And then people don't realize too, is that honey ha has its own special type of vitamin C and, um, uh, and you know, really great for you. And also uh, potatoes, a uh, great source of their, they have all, they're also their own unique source of uh, vitamin C that's um, not destroyed. Uh, it's not as uh, sensitive to heat. Um, so that, that was pretty interesting to discover, but, um, yeah, this is exactly most why. People don't think, yeah. Most people don't think that there's any, any value in potatoes. Yeah. They're incredibly healthy and nutritious. Um, just got to peel them and, uh, you know, obviously you can overdo anything. Um, cause, but you know, potatoes have, potatoes have protein and, and this form of vitamin C, um, and when they're cooked, the, the starches in there, if you combine that with the good protein and fats, um, is a really great energy source and helps to, prove, you know, help stabilize blood sugar, uh, especially, you know, eating, um, starchy things like potatoes or, or rice, um, at dinner time. It's a great, great time to have something starchy like that. And there's, so there's uh, and there's different kinds of these which give you higher ratio whatever like this like the honey um mm -hmm. i guess i prefer like like manuka honey or different honeys are have a lot yeah. higher well you know manuka comes manuka comes from like a very specific you know forest of trees uh um, very far yeah. away so no, I don't recommend I don't recommend getting your honey from you know the other side of the world, because um, okay. everywhere in the world honey. honey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get get your you know whatever is most local to you. So you know we get um, this really great raw honey that's like from uh, Georgia. It's you know maybe forty miles, fifty miles. So we can get it in you know a, a gallon. Mm -hmm. You put that. You put that in like everything. Yeah. Put it in, yeah. We put it in our gummies. Every time I make gummies, I use almost a half a cup. I haven't haven't yet made made gummies. I like to do. That. Yeah, do it. You'll be glad you did. Recipes on the Mighty Network. Okay. Yep. I think I remember. Yeah. Yeah. It's very simple. You just need to make sure you have, you know, the right uh, silicone mold. I link to them on there. Where do you get the, I guess, Amazon? <laughs> yeah. Yep, get them on Amazon or go to Target or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. All righty. Uh, any other questions or comments? Jenny, you were very quiet. Do you have any, any questions or anything? I was looking up all the carotenoid stuff online and everybody's saying oh they're wonderful because they're antioxidants uh -huh. right so yeah. this this was thoroughly challenged uh going back to the 80s where you know they said oh this is wonderful antioxidant let's give it to smokers and they tried this experiment twice they gave uh beta carotene to smokers and twice they had to stop the study because in very short amount of time, the, the study group that was getting the beta carotene supplements was getting dramatically higher rates of lung cancer. Yeah. yeah well, I, I, actually one of the articles, like I was scrolling through because I was interested to find an article that supported what you're saying. And so far I haven't managed to find one, but yeah. <laughs> um, however, um, the ones that I did read had that qualification, but don't take too much of it because there's a, a risk of cancer. Right. So again, this is like, um, you know, <clears throat> the supplement industry is, is Big Pharma Junior, right? And Big Pharma Junior was like, hmm, what can we extract, you know, or produce in the lab 
that we could we could call natural because it's exactly what's in the plants, right? Um, and then sell, you know. And beta carotene was one that they latched on, and this idea that we need all these antioxidants. But that's not true either. Oxidation is a dramatically essential function of health that if we're just completely inhibiting oxidation, a lot of things in our body won't work. And that's exactly what you see with that experiment. What happens when uh, you know, you're, you're putting all of this uh, you know, physiological stress on somebody because they're a smoker and then you throw in this antioxidant that also inhibits the thyroid, you get, you get cancer. I guess, yeah, I've always wondered about that. Like, you know, what's this idea about a antioxidants when we do need the oxygen? It's like, <laughs> yeah. The same. Yep. Um, if I can find this paper. Uh, I'm not on my computer, so I don't have my, uh, Well, I think if you go in to the, the Mighty Network, I post some of the research on the carotenoids in here. No, I didn't make that live yet. Okay, so I'm still working on this, uh, this section specifically on carotenoids. But, but I should have that done. I should have that done pretty soon. And, um, and so uh, that'll be live in the course. You know what you, what I think would be a great addition would be, you could, you could create a whole course on this about how do you research? How do you, how do you research on, on something? Cause that, I mean, just like when you know more specifically how to research something, you know, what, how do I, how do I know that this is bad for me or this or that? And, and so then when, when you know how to do that more effectively, you can share that more effectively with other people. Cause so often I'm, you know, talking with someone like, like vegans or vegetarians or, or, <laughs> you know, the, the whole sure. thing that's on us now. It's just like, it's-, it's I just added crazy. that. I will, that's that's on the list. <laughs> I'll make that, I'll make that course uh, or add that to the course, I mean, add that lesson. So great. Um, any other any other closing remarks? Otherwise, uh, did this did this make sense and kind of help tie things together in terms of like, what's, what's yeah, the big I, picture? What comes after? Phase one, phase two, right? What, where, do, where do we go from here? I'm looking forward to not rattling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Supplements. Yeah, it's, it's, to not being a pill jar. <laughs> not being a pill jar, right. <laughs> Great, well, you're well on your way. And yeah, remember, you know, is that uh, those things just help everything, you know, work better, work quicker at the beginning 
uh, as we improve the efficiency of our diet and our digestion. Great. Um, my mom, um, her dementia, Alzheimer's is, yeah, it's, it's deteriorating and, you know, I can't help but think that some of this would be due to the vaccine. Um, I don't know what, but like, well, how can I, I mean, other than making things simple and trying not to do what else that would be. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, some people's uh, bodies and immune systems just don't handle that sort of um, stress from immunization well. Because um, obviously there's plenty of people that are fine, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and it's like, I can't even, I can't even suggest that. Because, right. Because, you know, and it yeah. all... Like, yeah, well, you know, and if, my if, and yeah, if nobody's, yeah, if nobody, you know, if the person is not willing to say, well, okay, this might be what, you know, it's called vaccine syndrome. And um, uh, the doctors, the frontline COVID um, care or something, flccc.net. So Dr. Pierre Corey, he's a ICU, COVID ICU doctor. Uh, he was, he was the one who um, did the uh, the studies on ivermectin and was uh, silenced going back in you know to September right because um, if if he was allowed to uh, you know if his research was embraced it would have meant that all of the emergency use authorizations for the other drugs including the vaccine would have had to be revoked because those are only applicable if there's no other treatment that exists. Wow. So there wouldn't be as many, maybe as many deaths. I mean, my, well, my brother, I mean, you know, know how many people died from this? It is, it's speculative, but there's, there's plenty of experts that say, hey, you know, like Dr. Pierre Corey, he's like, you know, I had to break lines, you know, and um, go against my, the, what I was dictated, you know, because he was only allowed to give Tylenol to severe patients who even required eventually required intubation that was all they were allowed to do and eventually he said that no this goes against my ethics i know that there's ways to treat this and he eventually you know settled on ivermectin and we're talking like near you know 100 percent success rate and um he's also uh for people who have had a poor reaction to the vaccine they call it vaccine syndrome where uh, the body starts just kind of producing the uh, spike protein, um, you know, unmitigated. And that's when you start to see long-term problems like this because the, the uh, body's ability to self-regulate has already been damaged for whatever reasons of old age or disease or things like that. Um, and then they give those people two doses of ivermectin and then and they go, oh, that's better. Because ivermectin just it binds to the uh, spike protein and, and neutralizes the virus. What is the spike protein? Well, it's what the um, it's what the virus uses to bind to uh, the uh, ACE2 receptors in in humans. And it's like it's like the vessel that carries the virus, right? Well, no, it's literally like a spike. It, right. So it sticks out off of the sticks out, It sticks out of the, yeah. And the way that it's designed is that it fools your body and it fits into these ACE2 receptors that we have in every cell all over our body. Uh, and then that's how the virus kind of Trojan horses its way into your cells. <clears throat> but what some researchers are now saying is that the spike protein itself is what is toxic. So that you don't have to have the virus attached to the spike protein. You just need the spike protein to cause damage. And so, you know, most people will get the shot. Their bodies will produce spike protein. They'll, they'll feel sick like they were infected with the virus. And then their body will stop producing the spike protein and then they'll be fine. Uh, for other people, it can be more dramatic, right? And ivermectin 
binds directly to the spike protein so that the virus can't get into cells. And then eventually it, you know, the, the body eliminates it. It can't replicate. And the pharmaceutical industry used all of its muscle and strength to suppress that because, I mean, look at, you know, I mean, just Pfizer alone is, is like $20 billion in revenue just so far, just from the COVID vaccine versus ivermectin, which is in some countries costs 12 cents to produce a dose. It's not patented. So um, that's, a whole other, that's a whole other topic. I suggest you uh, look at those dark horse podcasts that I sent you. Oh, there's, there's, you, you sent them to me this morning. Yeah, yeah, there, there's, he, they have several episodes now where they've interviewed oh, yeah. uh, a lot of experts. They've interviewed Dr. Pierre Corey, uh, Dr. Marshall, I think his name is. He's the guy who, uh, he, he basically invented the technology back in the 80s for mRNA vaccines to exist today. Uh, and so he talks about that. And then there's a guy, Dr. Uh, Van de Wert, I think his name is. Um, who's one of the leading uh, epidemiologists in the world. Um, and he was, you know, talking about that, you know, uh, and one of the things that they've, you know, they're clear is that like, when you start vaccinating people in the middle of a, a, an epidemic, you start putting evolutionary pressure on the pathogen to more quickly adapt. Wow. And, wow. and if, you, if you're vaccinating just against the spike protein, then all of the all the virus has to do is modify the spike protein just enough so that it's not recognizable to your immune system anymore. And now we have supposedly, which uh, you know, another thing is that they're they're questioning a lot of what the evidence is like. Where's you know, how do you know that these are variants? You know, Delta, Gamma, Indian variant, and everything else. Um, but you know, that researcher he said at very early on in the um, vaccination program, he says. We are going to create uh, more variants because you're uh, isolating for one variable and you're going to make it much easier for the virus to adapt and, and find a way around, which it's going to do. So it's very interesting. And all that, all that is like said in those podcasts. Yeah, that's all there. Yeah. There's several episodes talking about that. I've, I mean, I've, I just listened to that podcast. I mean, I'm like, 12 hours in, you know, in the last couple of months, there's an, um, they just came out with one on Sunday and talking about censorship and, and how that's, you know, affecting uh, a lot of things, not just uh, medical censorship, but um, yeah, very interesting. So, so does this explain why we hear of so many medical professionals who are not taking the vaccine? Yeah, yeah, because if you look at research, um, there's nothing inherently bad about these vaccines. There's nothing that says you're automatically going to, you know, have problems, right? But when we start talking about, you know, billions and billions of doses of this, um, and in the grand scheme of things that we have a live, you know, epidemic, and, uh, and, and it, what is the context? Um, was this really the safest thing to do? Was it really the most effective thing to do? Did we actually, by bypassing other things, um, possibly exacerbate <laughs> the epidemic? Um, and so, you know, and this is exactly what we're, what we're seeing is that, you know, oh, people who got vaccinated, okay, great, you're, you're safe against the original SARS-CoV-2. But the variants... Are specifically yeah. adapting to infect, well, that's, and that's that we we know that so much from just a simple flu vaccine. Yeah, and and then it's like, yeah, wow. yeah, we, yeah <laughs> we just create you just create an uh, adaptive uh, evolutionary pressure on the uh, on the virus and the organism. And um, nobody knows. I mean, yeah, it's just it's so bizarre that I mean people are so adamant. To my my brother was like yelling at me last night. It's like, yeah, it's like. That no one really knows how yeah. this really works. It's, Nobody knows. It's simple. You know, so these uh, these doctors from FLCC.net, one of which is, uh, he, or I think she still is, but she's the top um, 
epidemiolo epidemiological uh, meta analyst researcher. So literally she's like the, the most renowned scientist to do meta analysis studies. And she published a meta analysis that says, yes, ivermectin is incredibly effective. And that was suppressed. And she works for the WHO. So, you know, what, what they're suggesting is that everybody should just have ivermectin in their medicine cabinet. And at the first sign of symptoms, or if you were exposed to somebody, you take a prophylactic dose. You take, you take one dose, and then two days later, you take another dose. And that is enough. That's all they're giving people. That is enough to drop mortality 90%. That you wouldn't have had to have it. I mean, why? 100%. They, in, in, um, the way the reason they discovered this, there was a nursing home that got um, scabies in France. So elderly population, high risk population, they got scabies. You treat that with ivermectin, and so they all got treated with ivermectin. And then you know, shortly thereafter, they're like, "Why isn't anybody in this nursing home getting COVID or dying?" And they said, "Well." They all took ivermectin. <laughs> Literally, it dropped the hospitalization to zero in that um, in that uh, nursing home. So, all right, now I got to wrap up. Now I know. The yeah. Right. So there's there's a lot of research, and you know, look, you, you know, the reason, you know, reality is, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make him drink. So. You know, um, I, I wish you the best of luck with your brother uh, and, you know, and your mom. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, there's only so much that we can do if people, you know, are literally like, la, 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 la. <laughs> right. Um, and, you know, and Jenny, you know, I know you, you know, um, for somebody who got the shot, uh, that, you know, it's, it's not bad. There's no risk, you know, if, if, but if somebody did and had problems, great. Ivermectin, problem solved. Mm. Very simple. And get on this diet. Get on this diet because everything we look at, this is eliminating the risk factors. Okay. okay. Great. Thanks. All right, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Fourth of July. We'll see you soon. Bye.